Welcome to Cyber Focus from the McCrary Institute, where we explore the people and ideas that shape and protect our digital world. Excited to sit down today with Melissa Hathaway, a noted cyber expert who has served at the highest levels of U.S. government, including for both Presidents Bush and Obama. Melissa feels we've lost some ground in our fight against cyber criminals, but as you'll learn, there is a pathway forward, and we can fix it if we take her advice. Thrilled to host Melissa Hathaway today, a friend, uh, a noted cyber strategist, uh, work led two efforts for two presidents uh, around cybersecurity, uh, first for President Bush, the the uh, comprehensive national cyber security initiative that I got CNCI right you got it right That's acronym right. town and uh, and then also led the policy re- review for President Obama um, works very closely and continues to teach thank goodness uh, both at, uh, in Toronto as well as uh, the Belfer Center at, at Harvard uh, Melissa thrilled to have you with us today and. Lots to go through, but before we jump into the into the meat of the issues, I'd love to sort of get your thoughts, and I ask everyone their why. What led you to focus on cybersecurity issues? What led you to public service and, and to continue to do such, such good work for the country? So good morning, and it's great to be here. And uh, I got into cybersecurity back in the early 1990s. And in 1993, 1994, I was working for Andy Marshall, who is one of the longest serving strategists to the United States government. A legend. A legend. Yoda. uh, Yeah. And I had the just the amazing opportunity to work with him for 14 years. We were friends uh, and stayed together uh, as colleagues and other things through the rest of his life. But in 1993, 94, then Secretary of Defense Perry had asked for a net assessment to be done on information warfare capabilities. What were the U.S. capabilities vis-a-vis other countries, Russia, China, France, uh, et cetera? And um, I had the opportunity to lead that net assessment for Andy. And uh, it really was when um, our exquisite military capabilities were moving from super classified to more of, I would argue, a gray world where we could talk about it. But there weren't that many people who were working information warfare in the United States government at the time. I'd put it probably under 100. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to meet with everybody who was working in our in our government, meet with all of the intellectual intellectual and IC, you know, analysts to understand what was going on abroad and then and do that nut assessment. When I was looking at that, I was like, wow, there are very few people who are the experts in this field. I said, this is the future. Everything is is going to be moving forward and, and, and being digitized. And I said, I'm going to become an expert in it. And uh, and there we go. About 15 years later, I got <laughs> asked for wish, book, wish, work for Bush 43 and uh, and lead the basically the, the I would argue the next net assessment for the country of you know what do we need to do in order to increase our capabilities and, and fill in those stop gaps. Well, good for you, and thank goodness you were going in that direction. We need the best minds focused on these issues, and I'd like to sort of go back to maybe CNCI and the Bush years, and 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 also the Obama years. Give us a little sense of what it was like to work through some of those efforts and. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Mark Twain, and one of my favorite quotes is, whereas history may not repeat itself, it tends to rhyme. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of the same parameters, and and uh, I, I'd just be curious for you to take us back, and then we can jump into some of the sure. biggest pressing issues today. Yeah, so CNCI, Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative, was really born, um, I actually was born on Groundhog Day. Uh, <laughs> Groundhog Day, February 2nd, 2007. Um, uh, Bush 43 went to NSA, uh, was hosted by m- my boss at the time, Mike McConnell, who was the director of national intelligence. And they were talking about what were the capabilities that we had in um, the intelligence community. And the president asked, well, what's happening? You know, like how vulnerable, what's going on in the United States? And the story was really a bad story. Mm-hmm. Uh, the amount of intellectual property theft being conducted by China, the compromises in the defense industrial base, and uh, the like. And so, over the course of that next, you know, 
month and a half was the beginning of CNCI. And uh, and it's funny because I can remember these dates like they were yesterday. April 1st, April Fools <laughs> is when I became uh, the director of the, you know, the the uh, a joint cyber task force for cyber. And I had all of these different um, experts from all of the different agencies were seconded to me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one or two from FBI, one or two from NSA, CIA, the whole government. Mm-hmm. And um, so I had this task force. But what was interesting is is that none of them had ever really worked together. And so I was basically assembling Team America for <laughs> cyber security. And it was one of the best experiences of my career because what happened was is I spent the next six weeks as everybody had to teach everybody else over lunch of what was their mission, what was their capabilities and, you know, and authorities. Mm-hmm. And then what threats were they seeing? And, uh, and, and over that course of the six weeks, we formed the team. They all started to understand we were all dealing with similar things, but we all brought really unique capabilities to the table. And then we started to come up with the, the plan of how we were going to go forward and shore up the capabilities of the U.S. And um, we, briefed, uh, we briefed the president. Well, we briefed the cabinet on June 30th. We briefed the president in July. We briefed the president again August 3rd at FBI headquarters, uh, September 20th in the sit room. And, uh, and that was when he told Clay Johnson, director of OMB, that this was all going to be new money. And, uh, and he told everybody around that table that this is going to be a team effort and we are all going to make this happen. And we put forward a budget request that was pretty significant new money a uh, little over uh, what was authorized and appropriated was a little over $17 billion of new money, largest add to the budget since 9-11. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that became the baseline of capabilities across the United States government. Many of our cyber capabilities at the time, as you know, were, had, were born out of 9-11 and the war on terrorism budgets, which were being cut in the 2007-2008 timeframe. So part of what CNCI was, was stabilize and move those um, budgets from supplemental to the base and uh, to continue those core capabilities at the agencies and then give real new capabilities to places like the FBI and DHS, which was really important. So I would say CNCI and what we did in Butch 43 was we saw the best of the United States government come together. We formed Team America. We all briefed as a team in front of uh, Congress. It was the only first time we'd ever done a joint statement for the record, all agencies all together. We all testified together. I briefed Congress 150 times (laughs) in 2008, more than any other person. Yeah. Learned a lot. And, uh, And we got the trust of Congress, and they appropriated and authorized what we asked for. Which is pretty awesome. So I, I had a similar experience working for the, the Bush administration, Bush White House, and, and it really was, uh, a, I think, personally, I'm biased, but a very well-run uh, executive office of the president, and, and everyone was fighting the same direction. I, I just feel like we're not always fighting for the same, not always in the same fight these days. But let's transition from CNCI to the review you led for President Obama. Yeah, so um, the Cyberspace Policy Review was um, really an important next step of the transition between the two governments. And I was one of the few people who was part of the transition. Um, I was corporate knowledge. I had the trust of Congress and and keeping everything together. And what we did was we basically affirmed what was the direct direction or the trajectory of all of the programs we had put in place for CNCI. Mm-hmm. And but CNCI was government, and so uh, it needed to be all of nation. And that was probably one of the key things that we changed for President Obama was we widened the aperture of what needed to be done. Um, and looking at the critical infrastructures more broadly, the role of DHS more broadly, uh, and what, um, how could we uh, really ensure that this program was going to continue forward? That was my main mm-hmm. job, mm-hmm. Uh, because as you know, when you have a, such a transition between not only parties but the presidents, they don't have to carry forward new starts or new programs, especially as large as what CNCI was. But mm-hmm. the good news was is that President Obama. 
uh, then National Security Advisor Jones, uh, Jim Jones, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. others saw the importance of this, and so we had the support of uh, that administration to continue it forward. They kept the budget, and then they expanded it. Um, and uh, and then it was important, I think, at that point, uh, they really wanted somebody who was um, not from the Bush administration, mm -hmm, even mm -hmm. though I consider myself purple, mm -hmm. uh, to be the leader of it and um, of it moving forward. And I had made a number of recommendations of who I thought was um, important to lead. Uh, and uh, and eventually, after a number of different leaders, you, you got like Michael Daniel was one of the key people because he was my partner at OMB and ensuring that CNCI was carried forward. So he was a good choice um, to, to, awesome. to, to move it forward. And, and Michael, for transparency, is a fellow senior fellow with you at the McCrary Institute. Right. So um, all good. You know unfinished business. So looking back to um, both CNCI, the review you led for President Obama, uh, and, and don't underestimate, anyone in Washington gets it, but for some of our viewers and listeners, maybe not. Policy without resources is rhetoric. So there was a big plus up in, 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 in resources that were brought to, to, to the cyber fight. But what, what, how would you grade where we, based on uh, all the proposals you put forward and, and whether or not they're being implemented today? Yeah, um, I, I'd probably give, um, I'd probably give us uh, the, I'd give Team America a C at best right now. What, what, a lot of things lost momentum during the Obama administration, and that was due to uh, probably the five largest counterintelligence breaches in the history of the United States of America. Uh, you know, and from the OPM breach to the Snowden breach to the CIA breach and, and so on. And every time there is one of those major events, everybody kind of like pencils down, we need to start over, mm -hmm. as opposed to continue forward with what were the key priorities. And so I would say that there were a lot of... Um, speed bumps during the Obama administration. Um, and uh, while some things continued to move, they just didn't move, they weren't accelerated. Everything got actually decelerated, I would say, during Obama because of those incidents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and that's not to necessarily be critical, it was sort of the, it's just the matter, it's just, the, it's just a matter of fact, fire. Yeah. to the biggest yeah. fire. You yeah. redirected resources, you, you dealt with a lot of challenges. Under President Trump, I would say that things decelerated further, largely because of the sort of the, the, the continuity of knowledge continued to get lost and um, positions were eliminated, people mm -hmm. were terminated. And, and so it was sort of how do you just keep this, the ship afloat, mm -hmm. I would argue, under that administration. There was really no progress during that administration, but at least there wasn't, at least it, not, it wasn't completely eliminated. Uh, and now I would argue that under President Biden, um, we're in a rebuild phase. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, there has been uh, maybe some resources, not the amount of resources that really need to be addressed if you think about 12 years of little progress that means you have 12 years really of bigger deficiencies and so there's a lot more I think needs to be done um, and uh, and a lot more focus and and I think the percentage of the budget that's allocated to cybersecurity is woefully in, insufficient and and I don't disagree with that but I, I I need to pull the thread a little bit uh what do we think success looks like? It, it is very difficult. It can't be to stop everything everywhere all the time from every perpetrator and every modality of attack, or should it? Uh, is it more building the resilience into uh, uh, our country, our economy, and, and, and how much of that can the government truly, they should be lead by example, but how much do, do we think they can truly lead? And, and, and what would an A look like in your eyes? I, I think that we need to focus on resilience first. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, graceful degradation. That you know, you, you shouldn't be able. You shouldn't have like one particular software that can bring down the majority of the country, <laughs> and uh, especially if it's not U.S. software, right? right? So <laughs> I, I mean, like that, that's kind of silly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I think we need to focus on resilience. I think that um, 
And within that, we need to start to prioritize what has to be resilient and um, diagnose what's making it less or what's making it fragile. And, uh, and, and that's a different way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Right now, it was like, you know, defense in depth, defend everything. That, that's, mm-hmm. that, that, that's like not spreading possible, all your resources right? like peanut butter, yeah. and that's just not going to work. You have to really get focused on where the biggest bang for the buck is going to be, where our biggest problems are from the country's economy first, mm-hmm. uh, and then national security and, and economic security probably second. Uh, but I think it has to focus on the economy. Um, and uh, I have a hard time delineating and differentiating and bifurcating national and economic security these days. So I'm, I'm with you, but I don't see them as either or. No, they're ands. They're ands. Ands. And yep. it's, it's sort of funny because I would <laughs> argue that Bush 43 was um, most of our decisions were made about national security. Mm-hmm. And I would argue that for President Obama, most of it was about the economy and mm-hmm. economics. And they're ands. They're not they're not ors. Not either ors. And, yeah. so, yeah. and so the teams that are working these issues have to understand how a national security s- decision will affect the economy and, and vice, vice versa. versa. And that that lear- that learning and that understanding does not necessarily it does not exist naturally in our government. Yeah, and then the divide between both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue and oversight right. it, it it does get complicated. Right. But we need to get there. Right. Uh, the consequences are too significant to not get there. Right. I, I, I want to touch on, and we were chatting earlier about uh, a couple of incidents recently that maybe haven't percolated and and grabbed the attention that they deserve, and and particularly on title insurance companies, Fidelity National and First American. What, what why did you sort of sit back and 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 say that these were uh, perhaps more relevant than some people think they are. Yeah, so Fidelity and First American, Fidelity number 1 title insurance, First American number 2 title insurance. 1 and 2, yeah. 1 and 2. Yeah. And then you got Mr. Cooper's uh loan and Loan Depot between the, like so mortgage and the loans for said title insurance between the four of them. I think they represent more than 90% of the homeowners in the United States of America. Think about that, 90%. 90% of the homeowners in the United States of America have been affected by the two or the four breaches. Mm-hmm. And they all happened within a three or four week period of time. So now think about that. I, I just closed on a house this time last year, so t- January 2023, Fidelity was <laughs> my title insurance. And uh, so they have where I live, they have my bank accounts. They have everything about me, and then uh, and and so uh, when you start to think about that, what what do you have to do? Well, at a minimum, anybody who owns a house should better better lock your credit everywhere, all four credit bureaus. Mm-hmm. But you also need to focus on the credit bureaus are only about your credit. You have to start now monitoring your bank accounts, and uh, because all of that information was lost in these breaches, and. Um, you know, so I kind of put it at almost at the same level as the OPM breach. The OPM breach got all of our SF-86s, all of our government information. Some, some our, of us, three different three, yeah, docs. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah they got a lot of years. data on yeah, us yeah. and all of our friends and all of our family and, all, you know, yeah, all, you yeah, know, yeah, all yeah. of that stuff. So now this, this, this set of breaches was all of our other personal information and our bank accounts, our financial well-being and other things. And so I, it's very disconcerning about... Um, ninety percent of the United States of if America. If you think about homeowners. that, that's that's massive. Ninety percent, and and lots of data. That that is highly sensitive, relevant to everyone watching. Right. Uh, pretty much. Uh, who who do you think would benefit from something like that? As you know, these are unattributed attacks, so we don't know who's done it. The ransomware. Ransomware generally is uh, it generally is Russia, mm-hmm. uh, and you could see where the Russian criminal activity could benefit significantly. One mm-hmm. title insurance is likely going to pay the, the ransom to get all of that data up and running again. Why? Because it was the year end, yeah. and so you got a lot of closes. Yeah. Uh, and now with interest November, rates, December, yeah. November, yeah. December, and now interest rates are falling, and so you got a lot more people who are trying to close on property and commercial or residential. So you can see how that would actually be, you know, I, I have an impetus to pay because of time. Mm-hmm. Time is money. Mm-hmm. And then the second is, is that, well, I've now got all of this financial information against a lot of institutions and a lot of individuals, and so I can monetize that as well. So you could see where that could be. 
But you also have, um, while China doesn't do as many ransomware attacks, uh, China is notorious for stealing lots of data because it feeds their AI models, and China is also in a real estate crisis. So if I need to understand what is stability or instability in real estate, you go after title insurance and loans. No kidding. Uh, yeah. and, um, and then and that data could be informative to what they might need to do from a, an approach from a governmental approach or whatever to stabilize the real estate market. Uh, second, it could feed their AI models. And, um, you know, the more data you got, the, you know, and feed the algorithms, the more, the better or more accurate the algorithms become. And so I'd, I'd probably put it in one of those two one buckets. Of those two buckets, yeah. Both of which are not good movies. So, uh, yeah. Don't like the endings or even the middle. So, yeah, the one uh, minute before midnight wouldn't be very happy with that moment. So, yeah, no joke, no joke. Uh, so, uh, are we doing enough? in the so financial services i would have put at the very top of the list of our critical infrastructure however you want to define it I, i'd put utilities there now today especially electricity and others but again this not the traditional it's not the banks themselves the, right. the big eight whatever it may be but uh what what more should we be doing? I saw DFS took some in New York. The the state took some action against uh, some of the title insurance companies. What, what what more can we be doing there? So I I think that the New York Division of Financial Services regulation has been in place since 2017, and they've been very prescriptive of what has to happen to financial services industry. But then they've swept in others. Mm -hmm. um, the credit bureaus after the Equifax got swept into the regulation. The insurance companies. Um, Just sort of like health. I mean, there are these companies you've never heard of that are holding all the all data. All this data, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so New York Division of Financial Services has done a lot to try to bring about better governance, better technical controls, and risk management processes writ large. So, I, you know, I, I, while I think that they're prescriptive on the technical controls, maybe too prescriptive on the technical controls, I, I still think that they're, they, they're trying to get to more resilience and, to, and, and, and corporate responsibility, which I think is important. But broadly, a lot of companies, including you know, some of the ones that were recently breached, would be, I'm not gonna, not gonna spend that money until I have to. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and because they just don't necessarily think that it would be a brand um, reputational hit that they would lose customers because it's it's kind of a captured market. <laughs> yeah, you don't have much choice. You exactly. Yeah, you don't yeah. have much. Yeah. Ha I don't have choice to go from yep. one to A to B or B to yep. C. There's not yep. like a lot of choices. So it's captured market. They don't see the value necessarily in, in protecting our, our data. Um, and maybe the fines are less significant than the corporate investment that they would have to make in order to actually do the right thing. And, and so then it comes down to how do you get people to understand of doing the right thing? And um, I think that regulation is necessary and warranted. That's what the New York Division of Financial Services is doing. Um, it's what the SEC is doing now. Um, but there's many more, I think, um, there's more that could be done. Uh, but again, we have to really kind of look at what problem are we trying to solve? Mm -hmm and be very specific about now what we're tr what problem we're trying to solve because otherwise we're going to we're going to overregulate and make our industries less competitive. So you open the door for SEC regulations which I want to jump into in a second. You've done some very good uh, work writing about this many years ago. We're going to make all your articles available uh, in our show notes, but before going there, uh, you know, I, I struggle with, and there's no empirically based sort of answer that you could say, of your IT spend, 15% should go to, to cybersecurity. Um, but when you look at some of these entities, if it's 1%, that might be generous. Uh, do you think we should sort of, is there... Uh, you're smarter than me, so is there a good <laughs> mathematical sort of approach to this, or should we be spending 10%, 15%, 20%? What, what, what do you think that magic number looks like? So I'm going to – I think that a company should look at um, their uh, digital risks, and I think that they need to start to look at 
if I were to have a bad day, mm -hmm. what is the cost per minute, per hour, per day of being offline when I need to be online? Mm -hmm. And when you start to look at the percentage of revenue, can I meet my recovery time objectives for a business continuity disaster recovery? Mm -hmm. All the companies have not. And, mm -hmm. and so their BCDR plans uh, have a altruistic recovery time, but not a realistic <laughs> recovery time. So what's realism? Well said. And so yeah, realism yeah. is 22 days. Mm -hmm. So 22 days, if I'm t offline for 22 days of my business critical system, that, that's the current average, what does that cost? And then how does that compare to what I'm currently spending mm -hmm. for my business resilience? And I bet you the 22 days of being offline for a major corporation is is a lot more money than what they're currently spending from the security and resilience of their enterprise. Yeah. And so if you start to think about, I need to reduce that window and get to my altruistic recovery time, not my realistic mm -hmm. recovery time, what do I have to invest to achieve that? And that, that changes the math and the equation, the balance sheet, mm -hmm. the capital costs, the operational costs, and how I'm thinking about things. Uh, and as opposed to it's 15% of my IT spend. And that's purely based on the business case, not the national interest. If you start uh, looking at all these issues and, well, you know, I was deeply opposed to this for years and I finally come around. I, I do think we need industrial policy. We need to mm -hmm. build in America. We've outsourced way too much. That's a much longer discussion. But when it comes to certain critical technologies, critical infrastructure and the like, uh, we, we should not be letting others, and we'll get into this in a little bit, I hope, yeah. but living off the land in right. terms of what we've, uh, what we've basically uh, provided uh, countries of, of concern. But before we go sort of the, to, the, to the countries of concern, let, let's talk SEC regulations. Um, you've been writing about this for quite some time. Uh, yeah. what, what, what are your thoughts here? So I, I wrote an article of uh, creating the demand curve for cybersecurity back in 2010 at Atlantic Council. I had just left the Obama administration, and uh, in 2010, they lost the House. So it was uh, so I was like, okay, well, you know, you've got now you don't have one party ruling the country anymore, mm -hmm. right? So you are going to have to turn to if you want to get things done in cybersecurity, you're going to have to turn to your regulators. And so I wrote an article back then on the top three regulators at the time, SEC, public traded companies, FTC, consumer protection, and FCC uh, for communications and the internet service providers. And here's what you need to do. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it basically laid out the arguments of, for the economy, mm -hmm. we, need these, we need to use the regulatory frameworks and, and, and authorities that we already have to force our key providers to uh, shore up and become more resilient and and then create a demand curve for a better product in the market uh, right and so because yeah. IT is just gives us what we what they want to give us they don't give mm -hmm. us a good product mm -hmm. and so but but you need to kind of look at the upstream to downstream and and such so I, I back then I argued that the that we were at already our Enron moment from a cybersecurity perspective and I remember filling out nonstop forms working at the White House on Enron, and I never, but yeah. So, so yeah, Enron yeah. was about good governance, and it was about you know it was about not cooking the books for mm -hmm. audits and mm -hmm. finance. So um, you know after we had the RSA breach, and you know among other things, it was we needed to we needed to introduce you know a corporate disclosure and transparency and good governance of digital risks to their digital businesses. So. Here we are, 13, 14 years later. Um, we finally have it, and um, it's a pretty significant wake-up call because it's, it's, it's not to me so much about the disclosure of I had an event and I've got a 8K, I got to mm -hmm. disclose in 96 mm -hmm. hours, right? Mm -hmm. the, the materiality. The timing is questionable. Well, materiality is yeah. materiality. If materiality I had, is. Uh, material is, is the same. Speak. If I had an earthquake and mm -hmm. I had, that's a material event. If I had mm -hmm. a big fire or you know a flood, that's a material event. Was it, mm -hmm. It's not new on materiality for companies. What is new is basically that the government is saying, we, we want you to have good governance of your digital risks. Yep. You can't just delegate it to this CIO, CISO, who's not even an officer of the company, and you as the CEO mm -hmm. don't know what the risks are to your business. Like any other business risk. Like any other true, business right? risk. So it's forcing that 
you know, corporate responsibility, enterprise risk management, um, accountability structures, uh, and, and signing off on the controls so that you can attest to the integrity or resilience of your organization. And I, I think it's a long time coming and, uh, and it's nece necessary because every business and every organization is digital. In, including non-publicly traded companies Correct. based on SEC. So for transparency, again, uh, I was one of the last commissioners through the Solarium Commission okay. to come to this. But we, we got there, and okay. I got there, because I'm, I'm, I, I, I always fear the check-the-box yep. mindset. We can do just enough, and then we can check the compliance box, is and not compliance or is there, and, and it, 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 it isn't. But done right— I mean, the 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 alternative was continuing with where we were going, which is not an alternative, not a good one. You can't um, have a colonial pipeline exactly take down the entire economy in the United States in less than six days from a basic ransomware attack, from stolen credentials through an unprotected VPN, and no oil and gas to the East Coast for six days, and they were not going to declare it an 8K. Okay, well, True you can't have Solar Winds, who's providing network management software to 400 of the Fortune 500 com companies in the United States and elsewhere, and all of the United States government and most of the European governments, and not declare that as a material event when the Russians took over their software. Mm -hmm. I mean, th like, no, so you're right. it's just you're basic, right. basic common sense. And, and national security. And national security and economic security. Yep. And so, you know, that that is the consequences for some that don't take things responsible. And now everybody's going to be held responsible. And it's been 13 to 14 years getting there. So let's go to the threat. And we, as much as things have changed, they've remained the same in some areas. But when we look at, if you were to rack and stack the threat environment, uh, firstly with nation state actors, then criminal enterprises, then foreign terrorist organizations, insiders. How would you sort of frame that? How would you rack and stack the threat environment? And you know I'm not going to let you escape until mm -hmm. we have a conversation around China, because if we're, we're not looking at the Communist Party of China and their intentions and capabilities, we might as well pack it up. But uh, I, I'd be curious uh, your perspective in terms of the threat. Well, let's start with China then. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I'm going to go back to my roots of the Andy Marshall days in a net assessment. And I have done an analysis of the Belt and Road Initiative globally. Mm hmm and of what are their initiatives from a digital infrastructure, positioning their national champions, the loans, the positioning in this digital space. And if you were to, uh, and I, and I, I uh, if you were to kind of look at this of the game of risk, which mm -hmm. you and I grew up with, mm -hmm. and the settlers of Catan, <laughs> which is what our kids have grown up with, mm -hmm. and you overlay them on what are the strategic properties, you get the BRI. And um, so they're playing a global long game mm -hmm. and have been pretty sophisticated, in my opinion, of, uh, you know, starting with the digital renminbi. So the, the digital renminbi started in 2010 when Bitcoin launched because mm. they knew that this was going to be the way. So they started working on the policies. They started working on the experimentation for a central bank digital currency, which is the digital renminbi. Well, they got 300 million people already using the digital renminbi, and they've got bank-to-bank -bank loans going with the digital renminbi mm -hmm. outside of the U.S. dollar system. Mm -hmm. Pretty strategic if you want to place, displace the U.S. dollar over a period of time of being the trading currency, of which they're starting to do. Well, remember, we only have about 340 million people in this country, so they've already got more than 300 million people using a CDBC. They're way ahead of the United States in thinking about the policies and that along those lines. Hmm. That's, that's just e-currency. Yeah, that's just currency. Yeah. yeah. Then you start to look at data centers and the need for big data uh, and working with in Africa and, uh, and elsewhere, e Europe, et cetera. They've got some pretty big data centers that are like the data hubs that are working on that e renminbi and working with government data from those different uh, regions, et cetera, and helping feed their AI algorithms. 
And so they've made AI as a national priority. Uh, and, and so what do you need to have exquisite algorithms? You need really good data from all over the place. Um, then you can start to look at, uh, they have uh, really began to perfect facial recognition technology. And they have deployed facial recognition technology along with Huawei and 5G along key corridors hmm. that are considered terrorism corridors to create safe cities all through the um, Eurasia, um, Central Asia, and East Asia. And when, I, when I'm when i starting to perfect, I, need, I have generally a homogenous population mm -hmm. and faces in China. I know mm -hmm. that's a general generalization. But if I can get facial recognition from all of these other countries and all of these other places, I actually now can perfect my algorithms on facial recognition for terrorism or safety, et cetera, and help me keep my own um, population in control or whatever and, and deployments, and et cetera. I'm not even to cybersecurity. You're not even cetera. to some of the traditional national security and military, yeah. That's... So if you start to take and look at what's going on from the BRI, from from e-currency to 5G and, and facial recognition deployment to data centers to positioning some of the national champions to providing loans and infrastructure build out in the developing countries, et cetera, and having a long view of what it means to build out diplomatic relationships, et cetera, they're well positioned. And, um, and they're seen as helping these countries generally, mm -hmm. uh, whereas Transactionally, United, I would argue. Yeah, but, but, but the yeah, United States yeah, is yeah. seen as being as Reactive, taking advantage yeah. of these countries yep, yep. versus helping them get to a better place economically and socially. And um, and so we don't have a global game mm -hmm. of going on. Mm -hmm. We don't even aren't playing strategic properties. Yeah, we haven't even entered. The game. So yeah. when you start to think about that and then how China is using their uh, instruments of power to continue to conduct intellectual property theft, industrial espionage, to preposition weapons and infrastructures, to have police stations that are rendition zones in the United States and Netherlands and elsewhere – you can really start to see that uh, you know we're we're not they're a player, yep. and we're a wannabe, and we need to start thinking much more strategically about where we are in the competition with China, and a much bigger scale than what things are happening the way that we're playing it right now. We're playing a tactical game against the strategy. So they're imitator. They we used to think they were imitators, but quite honestly, now they're. Beyond that, they're innovators in many ways. They're innovators. They have uh, they have um, driverless car corridors, 5G, you know, deployments proudly. They've got high speed trains. They got an infrastructure build out. They've got the e remembi. They've got a lot of things. They they've got a lot of problems too. I'm not painting them yeah, yeah, as yeah. as like the you know the, but 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 they have a, a much more strategic view of what the, where they want need to be want to be. And um, and they don't have to be tactical because they're not, you know, they're not a two year cycle of elections they're big and numbers. Exactly. And or quarterly earnings for their companies. Right. So they, they, they have a much different they have a, they have a they don't have to be tactical. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where would you put Russia, Iran, North Korea? So I, I think that Russia is also playing a, a, a great game. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, their algorithmic warfare um, uh, with is, the paradeuses too. They're 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 punching above their weight. The algorithmic warfare that is going on uh, and, and and using our social media against us is like is exquisite and uh, and it's cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, the bot, the bot infrastructure and their algorithmic warfare, inexpensive and very effective. They're, you know, the, it's and it's a, not new. They've been doing this for years, just uh, before technology. They've uh, been doing it forever. They've been doing it yeah. forever. Yeah. They've been doing it forever. It's just technology makes it easier. It makes it easier it's, it's and the speed, scales. The speed and scale. Yep. Yep. And, um, and I think that when you start to look at the disinformation, misinformation, uh, sowing uh, discord in society, helping us challenge the institutions that we believe in all of those things are being very effective and then secondarily i think that um 
there's probably three things. Second, they have used their war zones, Syria, now Ukraine, um, elsewhere, as really good uh, test ranges for weapons, weapons, mm -hmm. testing the weapons, mm -hmm. getting more them. precision weapons, stealing code in order to make more weapons, you know, from, you know, and, and they've been they've been very good at that. And mm -hmm. then I would say uh, from a third is, is using their proxies, you know, the ransomware to fund and get around the sanctions. Um, you know, if anybody thinks the sanctions are effective, I would challenge that. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, and the, they're not effective. And then when you start to look at how much ransom uh, payments are being made to continue to fund things, then, you know, you, you we're never going to get around that. So the, the Russians are good and we shouldn't dis discount them. And isn't it and not necessarily the right place for a long discussion around this, but it's also human-enabled cyber. It's not the way maybe groups we would work with are thinking about some of these issues. It's much more uh, traditional espionage and, and, and factoring in disinformation and and camouflage concealment deception, all the things that the, the KGB tradecraft books have been doing for, for years. They're, yeah. They're... Uh, implementing in cyberspace. You can go so. back to the White Revolution, NKVD. You're yep. just seeing these same yep. operations. They're just technology. AIDS, AIDS is a U.S. Uh, conspiracy in, in Africa. Oh, that, for sure. If you go to blew. South Africa, they yeah. still, be they they still believe, believe that. it. And yeah. the Chinese actually now run all of the media outlets, and so they propagate that narrative. Uh, so um, yeah. at any rate. Friends of thy friends. So, and 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 Iran. Just given what we're seeing play out after Hamas's horrific terrorist attack on Israel, and obviously uh, there have been more than some knocks on doors and U.S. critical infrastructure and yeah. utilities such as water and, and and the like in Pennsylvania. Do we underestimate Iran's uh, cyber capabilities and and their use of proxies, whether Hamas, Hezbollah, and Lebanese Hezbollah, and others? Oh yeah, for sure. But I, I think that we, we, um, I think that we are too arrogant, and we need to really sit back. and We've dismissed everybody. Oh, they could never be as can't good as this. us. They can't. Do they that. can't do that. And we even, even countries like North Korea um, have significant capabilities. Absolutely. Uh, now they're all going after th different things. So Iran, Iran's doing a very sophisticated use of proxy. But when you start to look at the fake videos and um, uh, the use of the um, uh, the electronic generated disinformation, misinformation, you're seeing it at a different scale now coming out of Iran mm -hmm. that we need to be really mindful of, right? Like, was that really a real video and real news or was that fake news? Yep. Was that a real voice or was that a simulated voice? Mm -hmm. And um, and we, we, I, I, we don't have the technology necessarily to detect and mm -hmm. deny it's, you know, broadcast. And so therefore it's gonna require a different approach for our, our people of helping them understand what's real and what's not real. Uh, and I don't think we're ready for that. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. I think that'll be tested out here in the United States and, and 76 other countries during these election year of 2024, because I think there's at least 76 countries Lots going to the going polls. On. Taiwan so got hammered today. Taiwan is this weekend, attack. Saturday, tomorrow. Yep. 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 Uh, or 16 yes. is it's happening so uh yeah so um but iran also is sophisticated in uh and thinking about alliances and the proxies so whether it's the houthis and yemen or it's hezbollah or it's hamas and working with qatar and others you know this is what's happening in the middle east is very dangerous right now really because we have really a tinderbox for any point in it's already time lit. Yeah. for miscalculation <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. in a very important uh, place for the economy with 15 percent of the global GDP is going through the, the straits there. Yeah. Um, you've got big oil and gas. Uh, you got nuclear powers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've got a lot. They've got a lot at stake happening right now among a, an area that has really never seen peace.
in the last 2000 years. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we need to be careful about what tinderbox, you know, gets lit and then and then and, and where that's going to go. Actually, I'm really glad you framed it along those lines cuz it's not just the cyber domain, but it's how cyber impacts and transcends all other domains, uh, land sea space and 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 that to me is critical in terms of calculation miscalculation and and uh, all bets are off in some respects but I would just underscore that in addition to a lot of their disinformation campaigns you sort of brought up how Russia used Syria Ukraine as their practice field I I look at uh, um, Israel, uh, mm -hmm. UAE, Saudi have been Iran's practice fields yeah, for a long, long time. time. And, and their, their movies come into a theater near you too. So, uh, the reality is, is when you look at some of their attacks on the water infrastructure of, of Israel, and if I were to rack and sack our critical infrastructure, I would put water at the top of, uh, criticality, but certainly not at the top of the list of, uh, security in terms of, for sure. Uh, in the United States. So that that is an area I think of of concern. And and any last words on North Korea that you want to we we've discussed that in a couple of other uh I mean North uh, Korea is going after recently. the cryptocurrency exchanges. Money. So money, follow the money. They yep. first went after Swift, were very successful of exploiting the vulnerabilities within the real banking yep. system. Then they've gone after Bank the of crypto Bangladesh, Yep, 900. they've gone after the cryptocurrency exchanges. They're very good at money laundering. They have pretty good, mm -hmm. you know, uh, cyber capabilities. So, uh, yeah, don't dismiss them. And, and we can we we kind of look at them as like, oh, they're a hermit they're, empire, yeah, but they're pretty darn good at what good, they do. They're good and they've got access yeah. through Russia and China for internet and, you know, they're I, we just, I think we're too arrogant. I, I don't disagree with that at all. I want to pull one last thread. I have to go back to the Communist Party of China. And, and, and there's been a lot of discussion recently about living off the land. Mm -hmm. And we've all lived this through the Huawei discussions, through other means. But the fact that the National Security Agency, along with uh, the Alphabet Soup here in D.C., CISA, FBI, and Five Eyes partners are, are actually putting out advisories in terms of living off the land. Firstly, for our audience, can you explain what living off the land means and then uh, what, 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 anything more we should be thinking about there? Yes, well, living off the land is um, China and some of our other adversaries have... Um, successfully exploited vulnerabilities in Microsoft software. And they have been able to get into core infrastructures being undetected because of the way Active Directory and Microsoft has architected things. Mm -hmm. And so when you get a uh, root access now into the core of key infrastructures, but nobody know how you, how you got in, we don't know where you are, and we're not sure how to get you out, then mm -hmm. um, and that that's part of what living off the land is is they uh, they China through different the Microsoft calls the threat actor Volt Typhoon uh, yep. but yep. everybody's got a name for it who yep. cares everyone right? comes up with a cool name yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so my Rosetta Stone is is it doesn't matter it's China mm -hmm. and China is in the core of our infrastructures they were able to get in undetected by getting through different vulnerabilities of Microsoft. And they have root access. And so now the question is, is what will they do with that root access? Do they have, is this, is this espionage? Is this pre-positioning to take down core critical infrastructures, et cetera? When uh, they broke in um, and we first detected parts of this, we, the United States government, um, it was in Guam and in the Navy infrastructure, and that was the beginning of, uh, you know, so there was key concerns because if you get into the Navy, the Navy is the first responders. If mm -hmm. there's an event in Taiwan, mm -hmm. which makes it a high value target for China, uh, you know, and so that was the beginning of the alarm bells. But then when they started, they, Microsoft and others started mm -hmm. to look at it, that there was broader more penetration. There. <laughs> more, more there, there. there. There was more there <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah. And so therefore we needed to be concerned about it. But so at the fundamentally though, at the, at the end of the day, I look at this as, you know, there's a concentration of risk with a few vendors who, uh, if you were to find the vulnerability mm -hmm. and penetrate them, mm -hmm. Microsoft it's all there. or yeah. solar winds or yeah. that, then you have the access and the keys to whatever you want to do. 
And I think that it's now a part of what uh, we need to start looking at is we need these IT vendors to start do a lot more of ensuring that they're delivering a good product to the market mm -hmm. that has few vulnerabilities, not hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities, yep, yep, yep. not with the principle of field it fast and fix it later, <laughs> that I'm gonna field it better now and continue to improve it. And, and that is not the ethos of our IT industry yet. But I'm hopeful that certainly not the software industry. So, so and yeah. I'm hopeful that the administration and the initiatives that are underway in Europe and Singapore and Japan and here are going to start to clean up the ecosystem because the ecosystem that is the core backbone of our economy and our critical infrastructures and our livelihood is really kind of a bad product that needs to be cleaned up. Well we said. I, I, I often say would we be flying airplanes if they did their design the way we do coding? I, I certainly wouldn't be jumping on a plane today. Right. So, um, and uh, and you, you touch on, I think, such an important issue around coding generally and the need for secure coding and... and uh, not a new issue, but you also uh, bring up what I think when we, so Presidential uh, po Policy Directive 21 is being mm, rewritten, rewritten, defining what our critical infrastructure sectors are. Uh, I, I remember discussions early in the Bush administration, so I was there yeah, before, before you came in, and we were talking about whether or not windows should be designated a critical uh, infrastructure. And, and of course, we had weird definitions at the time that have changed. But cloud providers, okay. space, we've done a lot of work on that. I think there are some sectors, at least subsectors, that need to be clarified uh, around all of that. Melissa, let me ask you, you've covered so much great territory. What, what, what questions should I, should I have asked that I didn't? Um, uh, what, what, what else can uh, you shed more light than heat on for our various viewers? So I think that we need to have a, a broader national conversation of what's at stake. And um, why do we need these things? And, and not let... Silicon Valley and Seattle tell us that we're going to stifle innovation. I think we need to change the innovation curve that's tilted toward resilience and strength. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that requires some national champions, you know, starting, you know. Set here, of conductors. <laughs> yeah, it, it requires some national champions to be out there talking about what's at stake and why we have to do these things and, and changing the innovation curve. I think that we also need Team America, mm -hmm. a broader Team America. I, I still see our agencies fighting each other uh, that we're not in resolve for the mission. We're in resolve for our party or for our personal, you know, our personal resumes. And I think that when we come into the government, I know for you and for me, you put all that aside. I'm, I'm, I'm here for red, white Absolutely. and blue and Absolutely. I'm here to serve my country and I'm here to make it a better place. And I, I get up every morning to change the world. And so I really want to help us change the world and get it to be more resilient, to come from a position of strength and stop fighting each other. I want to re reassemble Team America. Well, Melissa, thank you for getting up every day and, and changing the world for better. Uh, we, we have benefited from all that. And truth is, is we need... We need you to keep fighting. So thank you for your service. Thank you for continuing to uh, advance the ball. And I have a token of our appreciation, nice. both figuratively and literally, our new coin. Melissa, thank you. Thanks, and, Frank. And thank you for joining us. Today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.